Pray with me. Gracious God, thank you for our children. Thank you for creating us with the hearts and minds that you've given us. Help us to uh, speak the truth to you and uh, love as you intend. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. That person has a black cloud over them. Even if you have never heard that phrase, it's not difficult to get its meaning. We use it sometimes to describe depression. We use it to picture a person who's having a run of difficult and painful experiences. Sometimes we refer to bear fans as having a black cloud over their heads. <laughs> it seems like it rains on them all the time. We people have pondered why this is from the beginning of time. I'm not talking about bears, I'm talking about that black cloud. And today we get to hear one of the first attempts at understanding why bad things happen and how we respond. And I will tell you in advance that if you do have a black cloud over your head, the answers won't satisfy you. We will look at Job for several weeks on Sunday mornings, but that won't put all of our questions to bed it will be a little bit like considering heaven. We can get glimpses, but the complete story isn't available to us. Most of the book of Job is in the form of poetry. That's how it is with the most difficult or the most indescribable subjects. Only poetry can get us close. I don't know about you, but it seems like when our hearts are heavy, it is often a song that lightens us. The song gets past our brokenness in ways that mere words can't. The beginning of Job is prose and the ending too, but it's a setup for the poetry that cuts through it all. Job is us. Job is every man and every woman. And the topics of the book invite us to think about God, where evil comes from, and how we can remain who we are in the midst of trouble. If the black cloud stays with us, can we hold on to our faith and our integrity? And it is clear that there are options. It's not a given. After Job has lost his children, his possessions, and his community, his wife, in exasperation, speaks for so many when she tells him, go curse God and die. He doesn't. I imagine he was tempted. For me, one of the most wonderful things about the Old Testament is that it says the things we really think. It pictures life as it's really lived. It doesn't sugarcoat things. It airs the dirty laundry. If you don't believe me, just ask me sometime. One of my favorite sentences in the entire Bible is in the book of Job. It's found in chapter seven, and in chapter seven, Job is complaining. And I know that some of you think that Job never complained, but he did, very clearly. He wasn't a righteous man because he never complained. In chapter 7, he is complaining to God about how difficult life is, how hard it is to sleep, how quickly we age and die. And he tells God that he's going to speak up. He complains about his bad dreams, loathing his life, and tells God to leave him alone. And then there's my line. He tells God, you don't even give me time to swallow my spit. <sighs> when I first heard that, or read that translation by an individual, I said, hey, the Bible doesn't say that. So I went and got my Bible and looked, and it didn't. And I went and got another Bible, and it didn't. And I went and got another Bible, because I got a lot of them. And it's like, oh, wait, it says something like that. 
And I went and got another one, and it became even clearer that it does say that. But some Bible translations clean it up because we get a little uncomfortable when things are spoken so clearly. And you don't give me time to swallow my spit. You don't even need an interpreter for that, do you? Sometimes bad things come at a very quick pace. Job is a bold man. It takes a lot of faith to tell God the truth, and we need to. God doesn't believe us when we sugarcoat things. And Job told it like it was. And God is big enough and strong enough to hear us. Now, if Job had ignored God, that would have been unfaithful. If Job had cursed God and rejected God, then he would have lost his integrity. But he didn't. As we look further into the book, we will see that it was not only his wife who encouraged him to give up his faith in himself and God. He had three friends who did not act in helpful ways. And I am sure that if you have had your share of difficulties in this life, you have had friends who have not been very helpful. And I'll confess, I've been guilty of being an unhelpful friend. The truth is, bad things happen. And it's nice that in our Bible, that's acknowledged. It's not hidden. It's not pretended away. And sometimes they happen just because. It's not an automatic indication that the person has done something wrong. Yet many grieving people feel like they have done something wrong. Job helps us look beyond a quick answer that is fueled by our grief. And I can tell you about the book of Job that if you are in the midst of grief, it may not be the best time to look at what Job can teach us, but maybe. Grieving is a time for mourning and comfort. But when you are ready, Job is a wonderful study in life. He gets us to look at our relationship with God and our relationships with others and ourselves. And if nothing else, Job shows us that we can have an unfiltered and truthful relationship with God. Unfiltered and truthful relationship with God. He also invites us to look at what we believe and how much what we believe is a part of us not just uh, an outer coating, but what goes really deep into the center of who we are. Job's faith was such a part of him that it held him up even when it looked like he lost everything. He kept his eyes on God regardless of the circumstances. That's a real life test. So if your cloud is divorce, keep your eyes on God. If you have suffered loss, keep your eyes on God. And the best way to do it, I believe, is to keep the conversation going. You might call it prayer. Keep the conversation going. Don't be afraid to tell God what's really going on. God can handle it. It is an indication of faithfulness when we tell God the truth. Take time to read Job. See how he speaks to God. See how he listens. Try it out. Amen. Amen.